I'm Josh Kragic, and welcome to Rogers Music Tour. Let's rock. Hey everybody, I am Rogers Healy. I am the, uh, the zany and weird person behind Rogers Music Tour. And what started as a hobby and a passion um, and an extreme um, obsession with having the world's greatest collection of music memorabilia turned into having a mission of sharing the power and the importance of music. And today I have the pleasure of talking with one of my musical heroes, one of my best friends, believe it or not. And we're going to get there how that's kind of happened, but somebody who just means something really different to me. And I've shared this with him before, but um, all that being said, today we have the honorable Josh Kragic coming at us live from one of the most underratedly uh, passionate and loyal states, Ohio. So Josh, welcome to the show. Rogers, it's so great to be with you. Yes. Uh, I uh, am super excited and I've been uh, looking forward to this. So thanks again. Yeah. Well, thank you too. And, and uh, I think that this, this will epitomize the power of social media and the internet with all the pure uh, goodness that it can be versus what the internet sometimes is where um, kind of the backstory on my friendship with Josh and Abby's friends of friendship with Josh. But um, I first heard of Josh back in, was it 11? Yeah. Maybe? in 2011 and i've always gravitated towards music and i think i was i was trying to think about this when i was walking over here to turn the computer on one of my favorite artists of all time is joe cocker and joe cocker um he never was like the biggest star ever which i think was kind of on point with joe cocker's brand but his voice had that gravelly soulful just stop you in your tracks sound that even if you didn't love joe cocker you could appreciate them. And that's not the lead into Josh. But um, as a music fan, you kind of always wait for that person that's going to go and give you that same feeling that when you hear your person for the first time. And when I first heard Josh, he was on a television show. And I remember where I was, who I was with, and what I was doing. And I remember all those things before seeing Josh were literally the lowest points in my entire life. And I heard his voice. And I literally was like, what is this? And I felt this weird connection, which we're going to get to, which led to an actual real friendship, um, where I felt like I had like a flower in Josh's float, and I could go and be a fan from a few thousand miles away. And fast forward literally 11 years later, um, during the pandemic, I just said, screw it and reached out to him on Instagram. And we just became just became a different kind of friend. And so I want to let people know that the internet can be your friend, and it can lead to some really special stuff where I would consider Josh my pen pal, um, <laughs> uh, which, 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 which is kind of weird. But, um, but with all that being said, Josh, uh, again, thanks for being here. But maybe, maybe let everybody know who's listening and, and watching today. What is your background? Tell us kind of your, your, the wave that you've ridden to where you are today. As a dad, a granddad, a musician, yeah. and an icon. I mean, it, <laughs> when I stop and think about it, it is quite a long story. Although it, sometimes I, I forget that I'm not. 25 but uh, I was I was born in Worcester Ohio uh, my dad was a salesman is a salesman or well I guess he's a businessman my mom was a teacher and uh, uh, music was a thing for me early just it, like breathing I guess I just something I did and was into but I started playing I got a guitar in like junior high I, I, I got into music because of my uncle James. And so I started listening to bands like REM, the cure Metallica in mm. elementary. And that made me want to, along with my already obvious affinity for music, sort of do that. And huh. so I knew really young, I had the benefit of knowing really young what I wanted to do in life, mm. sort of, but also having the ability to, do it to some degree and so well i started playing go well, ahead you, you, you gotta i mean you gotta get us inside your head a little bit i mean you're what was the first time where you knew that you had the gift was it the fact that you could play music on a guitar that you had a voice that was unique what what was it that and by the way you just gave very very vast different metallica even though james hetfield is an incredible singer rem which is uh, an acquired taste and then i think the other was the cure which is an acquired, acquired taste. So <laughs> was it just because this was playing in your, in your parents' house or I mean, how did you get access to this in the eighties? Well, my first memory of music that I was obsessed with, completely obsessed with 
how I knew that I liked to uh, consume music and not, because I think there's a difference uh, between creating it and like, I don't know if they always correlate, you know, correlate with each other, your need to create and need to consume. I think it's different. But my first joy was Huey Lewis in the News. No way. Completely obsessed. No way. Yeah. I have a great story when you're done. Oh, <laughs> amazing. I, I mean, I wore out the records. I wore out the tapes. I, I used to go into the bathroom and slick my hair. I must have been five. Slick my hair and then go and put, get the Fisher Price. You remember it, the, the tan yeah. hollow record player. Put on Huey Lewis and News and Dance. But I'm saying, was it like poppy, like back in time? Was it I want a new drug? What was the, what was the Huey Lewis song that, that got you? I think it was from sports. It would have been, um, oh, what was the big one from that one? I was walking down a one-way street, yeah. just looking. That was it. That was it. someone to meet. I'm a woman. <laughs> wow. Um, I wouldn't strike you as a Huey Lewis fan, but again, the power of music. People don't realize when I think of the most underrated, soulful pop voices of the 80s, the two people I think of are Huey Lewis and Eddie Money. And Eddie Money, by the way, is an incredibly talented, he's, he's deceased now, but Huey Lewis is unbelievable. And he, yeah. was, he was like a sellout, Michael, a Michael McDonald sellout, even though Michael McDonald, you know, is an incredible artist and the godfather of Yacht Rock. But I had no idea you're a yeah. Huey Lewis fan. It makes me love you that much more. I, re I really am. I still am a Huey Lewis fan. I always thought of, the news was like, not one guy in the news was like the most, avert, like, Obviously, they're amazing players, like above and beyond great. But like not, not one guy, Huey included, was like this superstar amount of talent. But huh. together, as a group, they were. I don't know. Yeah. It just seemed to me like they were really sort of automatically blue collar and accessible. I also want to give notice to the fact that when I led into our intro, I talked about Ohio and I, I love Ohio one of my best friends is from Ohio and I never appreciated how um, loyal the state was but one of Huey Lewis's other most popular songs was the heart of rock and roll is still beating and then in the background in Cleveland and so <laughs> maybe an Ohio guy liked the fact that his state got a, a shout out in another really popular song I think they play that in sports arenas and everybody sings that part you know what I mean yeah and then Drew Carey brought it back to life when he had his show and they they remixed it and yeah. yeah, he did a lot for Cleveland, too. Yeah. Um, OK, so we're digressing. But OK, so you, you get into Huey Lewis in the news, you get your Fisher Price record player and you get it. You feel it. You feel it in your blood. And as a four or five year old, that was probably pretty unique where most people like myself were listening to the Peter Pan soundtrack or Captain Kangaroo. Your palate, um, which probably was overwhelming as a kid, truly was very diverse, very mature. And that probably comes with a lot of pressure. But what was the what was the childhood like being a, a I mean, you're a, you're a prodigy and you know that you are. And once you kind of figured that out, was it uh, was it a lonely island that you lived on? What, what was the um, the journey? Uh, I guess lonely for me has been kind of a default um, state of being for whatever reason. But yeah, when my childhood was challenged, um, I, I think that looking back on it, I think that I discovered that music was a way to get like my people noticed the adults noticed that I could play very young and I could, if they put a, if I walked up to a piano at super young, I was doing sounds that weren't just noise, you know, like most kids, they smash or whatever, but I was trying to play. Did you take lessons? I did, but not until later on. I, I, I got lessons from um, two different ladies at the same time. One lady taught me the sort of, I don't know, neurotypical half of the brain stuff where it's the technical, all the notes and time and the stuff that I didn't really like. And I had a second lady who I would go there and play the things I had been writing hmm. and working on. This was probably fourth grade, third grade. And she would say, well, this works because you that's a G7 and it wants to go to a C 
And that's why you like that in your head. She sort of helped me learn a little bit about why I liked the things I was doing naturally when I sat down to improvise. So the, the only thing about that that you just shared that was kind of weird is that in fourth grade, you were writing music. Yeah, but it wasn't, it was more like I had little ditties, little ditties that I was doing, but I was really young. I, I, my great grandma passed away and I wrote a little piano part. I guess there's a recording of it somewhere and played it there. That was my first gig was my great grandma's funeral. No way. How old were you? She passed. I would have been elementary, probably fourth grade. Wow. Maybe fifth. So you were probably eight, nine, or 10 years old, eight, nine, 10, 11 on the way to junior high, maybe, but yeah. And do you remember that? Did you think that this was, you know, a, a, a pretty big deal? Not that it was a gig, I, but. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I, I've never thought too hard about anything I do. I kind of just fall through life. But in that time and looking back on it, I think I was excited to be loved in that moment. Yeah, I, I think I wanted to love my great grandma, but music I had discovered early was a way for me to get love and to feel love and to feel noticed. And so I think that I knew that that was a thing um, that I would enjoy to do. But I also knew that my mom and others really loved the idea of it and that made them happy that I wanted to do it. So it was pretty easy choice for me to want to do it. And I had been used to wanting to be in front of people. In third grade, I wrote a play about a dragon monster or monster in a castle and the knight was sent to get him. It turns out the monster was nice or whatever and that we shouldn't have feared him or whatever it was the premise of the little play. And I played the the part of the guy or whatever. And so I wanted early to be, I was comfortable early performing. Hmm. Did that, did you, like I, I was, as a kid, I didn't have your talents. I still don't have your talents, but I always knew that I was different. And that came with, and then like, I embraced it, but I also like all this weird stuff that I've gotten in frames now. I've had this since I was literally a kid. And I would spend hours and hours just looking at it and studying it and obsessing it, which means there wasn't a whole lot of connection with other kids my age. And I always gravitated towards people much older, even now in life. I like I, I really love wisdom and storytelling and people that just fascinate me. But with your journey, with having these God given gifts, did that have you maybe miss out on some socialization stuff, maybe playing sports, dating? Was that was that kind of part of the sacrifice? Um. I've always been, I grew up in a small town and I, I may as well have been, a, a, you know, a centaur. I felt so different from everyone. And I've, I've struggled even today to feel where I belong and to be comfortable in my own flesh. Hmm. But back then I was able to bounce through social um, groups. I hang out with the goss. I could relate to the, I think the performer in me allowed me to be able to be whatever kind of version of Josh I needed to be, to be able to sort of be socially accepted. Did that come with some struggle and some identity uh, confusion? Yes. Um, and the older I get, the more I understand myself in that way. Yeah. But yeah, it, it certainly did. I, I think that feeling so, there was a point in time where I stopped desperately wanting to not be weird and, I, and stopped being afraid of being Josh yeah. and like being okay with it and allowing people to be shocked by my thoughts or words or expression. And, and I leaned into that a little bit and was a bit controversial. And that was part of my coping for the challenges and anxiety I feel socially. How old were you when that moment kind of happened? It was in junior high. I huh. met some other kids who also were, weren't like anybody else. And, that, and they were okay with that. And that inspired me to also then be okay with me. Man, well, not to, not to bring it, make it a little bit new level of real, but 
my moment didn't come till I was 32 years old. And it was in this week that I connected with you through the television show. And I had a different journey that this is not what it's about. But you know, music, again, just kind of plays to the soundtrack of the discovery of oneself. And, and one of my probably the most powerful quote I ever heard is you got to be yourself because everyone else is taken. And I think that music, you know, again, there's it's like music, like if there's something I love your voice, when I heard your voice, I was a fan. Some people might not love your voice. Some people might not love Don Henley. They might not love Mick Jagger, but that group of people that can connect on that, that's your home, right? And I think that's what, that, that's what music is so much powerful than, than people give it credit for. So with you, junior high, you found the real Josh. Music was always uh, your true love, your first love, your forever love. What was the journey from an adolescent to you know getting on the television show? What was that like pursuing music and, and kind of learning what the, maybe real world was like and the competition factor and how people like you and I aren't born with a famous last name. So we have to go earn our, 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 our cloud. Yeah. Um, I, I, I had a chip on my shoulder that was really heavy for a long time in that I was jealous and bitter and wanted so desperately to be loved really. Mm. But I started my journey professionally in like, my 15th year of life. <laughs> I said that weird. Yeah, that was very, uh, well. <laughs> wow, I'm an old time. 1995, the... <laughs> the year of our Lord, I decided to come out of my cocoon and be became uh, alive before my driver's uh, license was available. But anyway, it sounded from, really smart. It, well, it, maybe that's part of the, it, yeah, I'm not all that smart, I find most of the time, but I, I told this place in Lodi, Ohio. I've probably told you this story before. I don't know. Uh, this place was called the Shady Glen. And I'd heard they had music and I wanted to play. And so I told them I was 22, but I was 15. How they believed me. I mean, I had some scraggle beard, but it, I mean, you look back at, I mean, it was clearly, I was a child, well, but. You sold it well. I sold it and I was good enough. The guy liked it. I think was the truth. He liked it so much. I did a Bob Dylan song on a tape. Which one? You hit the, the two buttons yeah. down. It was uh, don't think twice. Wow. It's all right. Yeah. And, and he said, yeah, come play for four hours. We'll give you a hundred bucks. And so I didn't have a driver's license, but I drove there <laughs> and I drank beer and I, played for four hours i repeated songs my my first handful of gigs i repeated i had two hours i just did it again i would just keep playing the songs that i felt best with yeah and well, what was the song what was your go-to song as a 15 year old pretending to be 22 drinking beer driving driving dirty i i i wanted to play originals but there were some songs like I had this fake book. Have you seen these fake books? They're called fake books. I don't know why. I uh. guess because you can fake the song, but they're full of like standards and old songs and new songs and like the chords and lyrics. And so I found this song and I'd never heard it called Frankie and Johnny, which is the old time Frankie and Johnny were lovers. Uh, anyway, and I did my own version of it. Uh, I often would, I, I regret sometimes having cover songs that were so different from the originals that I might as well have just made my own song because they were barely recognizable as the song. And so I did uh, Johnny Cash's, I still do it, um, Folsom Prison. Really? I, but I did it in a really fast sort of version of it. And it evolved with bands that I played with and stuff later. So those were easy go-tos and also Bob Dylan and the blues because I could just make it up on the spot. So I would just play the blues and just sing what I feel. And, and how was that received as a 15 year old? Did you feel like you're on top of the world or was it more like Jeff Healy and Roadhouse where Dalton had to come bail him out because all the drunkards were throwing beer at him through a cage? I mean, it, it... <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, it was a bit like both, but it wasn't anger. It, it was just a rowdy place like that, but they loved me. They were like, they, they danced and carried on. It was a good place. 
good thing they didn't serve liquor there because they got rowdy just with beer. Wow. I love it. So I'm trying to mute. I don't know how, but my text messages just popped up um, on my computer and I'm making sure it doesn't beep when, when you're talking. Sorry. Oh yeah. No, I'm, that's, that's, yeah, that makes sense. Remove from doc. There we go. Um, okay. So, so back to the, um, to the, to the journey of Josh, 15 years old. Can you hear that beep? I do hear that. Damn it. Sorry. I mean, obviously this can all get edited out, but I'm trying to figure out what I need to do. Maybe there's a preference within the messaging app. Yeah, but it's not even open. Let me see preferences. I had this problem once too. There we go. Auto play message effects, play sound effects. Can you see the messages pop up? No. Okay. I only see you in your um, background. I'm sending you all this stuff, by the way. I got fun swag. I got hats and t-shirts and cups. And... I love that hat. Yeah, same. No, it's a, it's a great hat. Um, okay, so back back to the journey of Josh, 15 years old, playing illegally, drinking illegally, driving illegally. Hopefully not yeah. drinking and driving illegally, but that's another podcast that we'll get that's to. That's a different one. I'm going to dim the lights on that one. But <laughs> what, what, what got us to you know, 30 year old Josh, where we all knew your story and we haven't even talked about the TV show and and what it was, but I mean, there's a, there's a 15 year gap between your first gig and the biggest gig gig at that point in your life. And what, where were we along the way there? I was in a couple bands, always, um, always the front man on it. Um, I was in a band called love lies bleeding with a couple guys in my hometown, wrote a lot of songs. There's some music, somewhere from that i'll put it somewhere for people to hear but and then i was in a, a heavier what's it what's called, actually here's a fun what how do you go and like name a band what's that process it's it's not all that different for me than the titles of songs it's more like i it it comes to me like i would discover it that would be like the most always stressful there. there's a reason every company that i have relative ownership in is named after me because it requires zero stress. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I would have named it like North star realty. And then I could have just ridden through life without anybody hating me, but uh, okay. So you, you have your first band and then you go to your second band and you know, were you living in Ohio this whole time? I was living in Ohio. Um, I went out to LA and I, I played guitar for my friend who, who had a record deal with Hollywood records. His name is Grand Bell Fisher aka jesse littleton he's incredible artist he's still doing his thing and so our friendship had developed and then i played guitar for him um which was a great experience but of course in the back of my head was always yeah but what about you but i need to this this is great but i need to do this and so um i came back to ohio and and started josh Kragic band uh with mitch and corey uh, Corey Gillen and Mitch Pinkston and um, we still play together and you know we'll still probably make some records but um, slogged it out in Columbus and regionally playing gigs uh, sleeping on couches I met my fiance Megan and she helped me to survive and be loved <laughs> and I love her and grateful for her and so um, eventually a friend of mine well, I guess it was Jesse he said, Hey, there's this thing called the X factor. And, uh, it's a million dollar contract. And well, he said that after I was like, I'm not, I'm not going on some show. I was very dubious of those kind of shows admittedly. And, uh, but when he said it's a million dollar record deal at the end of it, I went, Oh, <laughs> you said oh. X factor. Yeah. It was X Factor. Turns out it was five million dollars, but of course that's not exactly true either. Um, and so when the time came for the audition, he got very sick and couldn't go. And my truck was in the shop, and so I called my mom and said, "Do you want to go to Chicago and do this weird thing?" And she said, "Yeah." And I knew the camera would love her, and so she kind of helped me, I think, to be uh, noticed by the producers beyond just my vocal ability. Yeah, I'll never, I'll never forget. Uh, and and before we take a, a dive into that, which is what led us led to our friendship, I want to just ask a question that you know I've got friends that have played pro sports, and I think maybe the parallel is baseball, like playing in the minor leagues, and it's just such a sh- it's such a crappy lifestyle that 
you it's, you want to live through it once and that's it. But when you're talking literally sleeping on couches, you mean that, but also the unpredictability of maybe what the next paycheck is going to come from. I mean, how long did that go on for? And at what point did you realize that you have a gift of resiliency that most people don't, which is why you've continued to be relevant, you know, this, this far along? Well, I guess I, I sort of haven't considered my gift of resiliency until hearing you say it now, but I think you're right in that um, it was hard and I depended on a lot of people and I owe a lot of people some love and, and frankly, cash for their <laughs> letting me stay. My brother let me stay in the third bedroom, him and his roommates during his college years. And um, I had a lot of love along the way that I'm grateful for. But it was hard because I didn't have any money and I would get the money and, um, you know, it was gone. So like I got money on gigs and everybody else I've ever played with had jobs, had careers and school and real life things that I never, I've never even known that kind of life. I, sometimes I fantasize about being that kind of normal life, living like being like an ad. I could have been like an ad guy, I think, but I. A jingle, you could have done jingles. Jingles. I could have done the jingles. Yeah. Yeah. Diet yeah. Coke is good. Josh. Yeah. Boom. That, that's good. That Thank isn't you. that much below par on what yeah. we hear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think people really appreciate the, the journey of anybody that lasts. And I think that in life you all you have a superpower, you know, and I think that it might be one of the reasons we have this soul connection outside of music and outside the soul, soulful part of music is that the thing we have in common is neither one of us have any quit in us. And I think to find people like that, whether it's through something as weird as Instagram or a television show or yeah. at church or in the grocery store, you kind of cling to that. And it kind of, for me, it makes me lose a lot of hope in society, but then someone like you brings it back. So Again, here we are. You're a 30 year old man. You're in Ohio. It's a, you're writing a movie, right? And if the people that remember the show, you were working at a burrito shop and you yeah. were, a, a, you know, a burrito artist. And then your mom and you drive to Chicago. And, and then what happened? Well, it was rainy and it was a long, I mean, there was thousands of people. I'd never been anything quite like it. It was bizarre. It was strange. It was like being in line for a roller coaster, but much worse. Mm. Um, but people were cool. We met very cool people. I don't mean that like the people were bad. It just, you know, I'm not big on crowds, I suppose. But uh, eventually it got to the point where the first day they had these little tents set up and you'd go in and sing to one or two people. And then they'd give you a card at the end of it. And if you got the card, it was a whole like bowl of a basketball stadium or arena full of people waiting to audition. And they just went like across the, went in order across. How long was this season one of the show? It was before they'd even ever aired it. I, mean, I think that the UK had had the X Factor for some time and it was a big smash hit. Wow. And this was so going to be the first one in america which by the way y'all that are watching that are a little bit younger than us it's evolved into america's got talent and, yeah and, and so just kind of to show the magnitude of this show and for someone yeah. who was the star of the very first season so you get the the you know new iphone meets roller coaster line and you get in there and and, and what happened well i sang uh patsy klein's crazy i thought that showing the intervals of that because it's not easy that song I find, um, acapella, uh, you know, crazy. Da, 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 da. I wanted to show ability, I guess. How did Plus, you even pick the song? What's, I mean, it's gotta be more stressful than picking a band name. Millions honestly, of songs ever, including ones that you've written. What made you go and pinpoint Patsy Cline's crazy? By the way, you know who wrote that song? Willie Nelson. You know where he wrote it? The only thing I remember about this story is that he was sitting nervously outside of her house, waiting for her to hear it. 
No, I think he wrote it at a bar called Tootsie's on Broadway in Nashville in one setting. Um, I might be wrong, but I'm impressed you knew that it was Willie Nelson. So yeah, I, back back to Josh. Okay, how well, did how did you pick the song? It's one of my favorite songs, but honestly, I didn't put much thought into it. And a lot of times when if you were to watch me, Josh, do my thing, it would look like there's very little effort or thought put into anything because I just improvise everything. I never sing a song the same way twice. Really? And so even in life, I do that. And I just go on feel. And I just felt that was the song. And I also prepared Billy Joel's um, uh, Moving Out. Wow. It's a great song. It's a great song. It sings well is why I picked that one. It's just in a wheelhousey. It's easy. Have you seen him in a concert? I uh, know, dude. I the, the, again, this is. I'll, I'll call you after because we're gonna waste the world's time with, with this. But um, he's such a gem. And I was telling when I did this the other day with my buddy John Andrasik of Five for Fighting. I consider John my, our generation's Billy Joel because the piano, the art of the piano for some reason has just been faded away. And I think that's why, you know, we, we lean on you as uh, one of the voices of our generation as well to keep the piano alive. So you go and sing Patsy Cline crazy. Um, Y'all that haven't watched this, you know, get online, get on YouTube and you can see what I experienced, um, which was magic. And I remember watching it live and, I, and I've told you the story kind of off record of, of the setting that I was in, which is the, it was literally the darkest place in my entire life. And I was miserable and I was sitting on this uh, on this sofa. You had on like a blue denim shirt. And I think like kind of like both of our stories, no one expected what happened. Yeah. And, and what was it like living in that moment when you literally just owned the world? Well, once they had sort of done a couple rounds I had then decided I wanted to do at last for when the cameras were on. Like once they decided and narrowed it down that I was going to be on and that was some weeks time before they, I knew they were going to, I just had a confidence that they were going to have me on the show. So you're saying you had already, so the Patsy Klein was not the crazy was not on television. No, it was in a little room, a little booth. And they, we did two rounds of that. And I sang for people again. And then the third thing they, Hey, I, they did have lights and cameras probably for to take back to the creators and talk. And they, they, people had gone in and been in there 25 minutes and I went in and was out in five. Mm. I thought that's either really good or bad, Yeah, but it was good. And yeah. so then they said, well, what song are you going to sing? I said, once they said, okay, we want you to sing for the judges on the television show. They said, what song are you singing? And I said, I want to sing Patsy Klein's at, or I mean, excuse me, Etta James. James at last. And they said, you don't want to do that. And I said, what? I was taking, I was like, what's a strange thing to say to somebody? I said, I do though, but what do you mean? And they said, well, Simon hates that song. He's heard it too much. He's bored with it. It's not going to go well for you. And I thought in my head, I had this thought, like, I want to do songs that had been, that I love by female artists, because it gives you this automatically different feel because of just the nature of that I'm a baritone and they're altos or sopranos. And um, so I thought he's, I said, he hasn't heard me do it. And, and they said, okay. And that's why when you see, if you watch it on YouTube, you'll see he's uh, super dubious of me. And they even set it up to make me look. Uh, You're the hero. I don't know. You were the hero. Yeah. They, you were they set up like I might be a rube that I can't sing or something. <laughs> a lot, a lot, you're using a lot of words that people are going to Google. And I'm just over here playing it cool. Like I know dubious, but when you say it, I'm like, okay, rube, I'm going to Google that when we, when we, get I don't even here. know. Rube is something that I've heard guys say went for like, uh, you know, schmuck or uh, something. Okay. Well, it still works. And Common not, person, layman. Even then, just L A Y M A N, everybody. Um, <laughs> okay, so so the the journey continues, and you know, and again, everyone got to be a part of it. I think that this was one of the first shows and one of the first moments uh, as a um, you know as a spectator that we all could kind of just pick a side, and it was a different kind of competition on 
on all sides of it. But with X Factor, how long did the journey uh, continue for? It was about eight months of the year that I was working on the X Factor. Wow. Because they, they, you know, I'd come back home a little bit and I couldn't tell anybody anything. Really? I had it signed a... Ironclad a, NDA. Yeah, NDA. And they said, well, we'll just edit you out if you tell people but you were just randomly gone for almost a whole year and you had to just pretend like you were on a vacation yeah until we we until they aired what you saw that night i couldn't tell anybody oh my and, god but how? they had uh, they showed me in some promos that's how i knew like all right this i'm gonna get a good spot in the edit because they they seemed to like me and be excited about me and when i saw them use me you know i'm doing this or something in a tv spot for to promo the upcoming episodes of the show i thought that's good that's probably good well and, and so how long at, at what point were you did you exit the show was it like a place was it i don't remember yeah it was down to, i was a runner-up so i was there all the way when i came home it was christmas eve is when i flew home from los angeles and so it was from like June or May uh, and then sometimes at home, but, you know, on and off L.A. and home. But uh, I got home and uh, spent Christmas Eve alone that night. Oh, my gosh. Who was the group that ended up uh, winning that, that season? There was a, a young lady named Melanie Amaru who won and she's got a huge voice. She sang uh, so well, so well. But she's no, she's no Josh Krajic. Melanie, if you're watching, recount. Uh, <laughs> so so you, you get home Christmas Eve. You, uh, you have the Ebenezer Scrooge dinner for one. And then yeah. was it straight into the studio? Because it took, I, I remember, and again, dude, this makes this is me showing my cards. I don't remember what the process was, but I was waiting so long for something to come out because the Josh Krajic band, I don't think was available on iTunes or no, Amazon. Unfortunately, or, I had uh, to take all that down. Oh, you had to? Show. Yeah. No Meanwhile, way. There were some people who hadn't. I think they didn't think it was, they said, this, what somebody said is it's not fair that you get to benefit when not everybody gets to benefit. And now these people that are on The Voice, they have iTunes that come out every single week of covering some stupid ass country song. Yeah, but that cash is going to voice mostly. Oh, is it really? Yeah, it's so like this stuff was my personal band. Like, oh, I got gotcha. you. They didn't have fingers in it. I got gotcha. you. So like, I sort of get it. But at the same time, it's like, it's not my fault that these other kids and other people weren't working musicians like me. Yeah. You know? So what was the process when you got back? Uh, there wasn't very long until I was flying to LA, London and Nashville to start working on the record. Um, I worked, start, start working with these guys, Phonogenic Records. And the truth is the, the, the whole contractual legality and logistics of everything after the show was a big jumbled nightmare that I still don't quite understand. And so it took a long time, even after I had recorded the uh, Blindly Lonely Lovely, um, for it to kind of find its way out so it took too long in my opinion it was at least a year wasn't it at least a year i think it was out in 13 even maybe i forget yeah no i remember uh, i was and i was so excited I, I literally felt you know like something was about to catch fire and uh and, and it did uh okay i want to get into the to the more music part of josh and um yeah again i i didn't i didn't realize that i mean i knew you had a really diverse palette of music, but The Cure, Metallica, Johnny Cash, Patsy Cline, Etta James, all great musicians. But um, let, let's have let's have some fun questions. Let's let's talk about a duet, which I think your voice is too powerful. Where I go to the Joe Cocker thing, I was doing some dives on him this morning, and he had one of the most beautiful duets ever with a girl named Jennifer Warrens, and y'all would know it from the song "Officer and a Gentleman" with Richard Gere and Luke Gossett Jr. Yeah. Lift us up where we belong. But even in that duet, his voice is just it overpowers her because it's just such a unique, strong voice like yours. But if you had to duet with anybody ever, who would it be? And it's got to be somebody we know. Well, the first thing that came to mind is Bowie. But really? Yeah, I, I think that's that, a surprise. I mean, that's a surprise. 
I think that something about when I watched him watch the footage of the drummer boy and With like Bing how Crosby. different those those two were and it worked I thought this is a guy who could do it with anybody, even a schmuck like me or Rube like me. A Rube, Googling it again. So <laughs> David Bowie. But honestly, if I could pick right now, it would probably be Adele because I want to hear two smasher full voices. I want to hear my voice next to hers. Who, who's, the, who's the voice that when you've heard it, and it's, maybe it's not a Joe Cocker type, but who's the most... Um, I don't know. Like when you look in the, the voice mirror and you hear another person who reminds you of yourself the most. Um, if I were to be honest and I'm embarrassed of, of, of my, I don't know, sort of similarity to Chris Cornell was a big oh, influence God. on me. Oh, golly. We can have a whole hour on Chris Cornell. I, I mean, that, that records, um, uh, I mean, the sound garden I loved. I used to put sound the bad motor finger on and play this wizardry game on the NES and just be gone from the world and just play, uh, listening to it. But when I heard uh, Euphoria Morning, it was in 99, I was graduating high school. It like reaffirmed what I already knew, which is I have to do, I have to go for it and never give up because this is this is so inspiring to me this music this crazy record he made this different kind of it's nothing like Soundgarden. it's this new weird thing and i thought Ugh, i need it i gotta do it did you ever see him in concert yeah i saw him that tour i never got to see Soundgarden; just never worked out but i saw him on the euphoria morning tour and he was fantastic oh i never he saw sang him. the high notes i had heard from people who had worked said they worked on his tour that they had tapes of him where he they couldn't use they were going to make a live album they had tapes they couldn't use because he couldn't hit the notes such and such i find that to be likely maybe not fully true because when i you saw can him, say bullshit i know you're going for it and then <laughs> the bullshit i'm trying yeah. to, you saw me holding back it yeah was no, more that was awkward good. than just saying it you yeah. just said it yeah just it, you said it with your eyes <laughs> <laughs> I wish oh. I could read people's eye language, by the way. I, yeah. I, I totally misinterpreted it all the time. But, but oh. when I, he hit the notes like with the arm up and in, in the whole music hall, it's like, wow. I said, this guy, something. Dude. I even liked the, uh, uh, <laughs> what was the record? Scream. With the, where he made it, he made that record with, uh, who's the producer? traditionally did hip-hop and pop music timbaland yeah i really? like the timbaland cornell record i don't even know there so here's here's something i admit every year i pick and i know we're, we, we've done some text on this but i try to pick a different artist every year that like i just never got into and i kind of forced myself to be a fan and this year it's been bruce springsteen and it's gone really really well yeah but three years ago it was cornell where like i just knew black hole sun i knew spoon man i knew the cliche sound garden stuff but his solo stuff, especially acoustic, is yeah. unbelievable. And another fun sight. fact, he was tall. He's a six foot five guy, which most rock stars, most people for some reason in the limelight are not our height. And so I yeah. have the affinity for him, but I never got to see him live. But um, my favorite, one of my favorite covers ever was Chris Cornell singing Nothing Compares to You. And I'm sure you've heard yeah. it a million times, which love it was made famous by Sinead O'Connor. Fun yeah. fact, you know who wrote the song? It's one of my favorite Prince songs. See, okay. See, again, this is why we connect. Here's a double I bonus love, question. That's really who I would do that with, by the way, but it would be guitars. Okay. You know Prince's real first name? It's Prince, is it not? Rogers. Oh, you're right. Yo. <laughs> How about that? Prince Rogers Nelson. Oh, that rocks. Yeah. So that I'm, seriously rocks. He, he was the second most famous Rogers. I'm kidding. Okay, so, <laughs> so the duet... David Bowie, Adele, Chris Cornell, Prince. Um, I like I think it. Chris and I would be too similar of a voice for it to work. Yeah, but dude, that's that's a that's thunder. Imagine the two of y'all on the same. And again, I keep going Joe Cocker, but Chris Cornell might be the pick. And his range, his ability, his songwriting, and just the fact that he he was like this the entire time. Audio Slave for the first time I heard them because I loved Rage Against the Machine. When I yeah. heard Cornell singing with Tom Morello's freaking guitar riffs, I was, oh, it was, it was awesome. It was strong. That's, 
that one song show me how to live i mean you can't help but want to get punched in the face yeah no i want like, to you yeah. want to get punched yeah i'm gonna after this i'm just gonna go outside and play until someone hits me right in the face that's what yeah. i want to yeah no it's gonna happen yeah um <laughs> okay uh, another song another question that i love to ask people is and i don't know if i told you about this earlier but you're, you're stuck on an island and you got access to one song. It doesn't have to play on repeat like you're in jail, but you have one song that you're allowed to go and play that you have ownership of. What's the song? Careless Whisper. Wow. Really? <laughs> yeah. Are you serious? Again, That's just careless. what came to mind. Look, like I said, not too much thought goes into what Josh does. So. Wow, what another tragic curveball. So here we are, The Cure, Patsy Cline, Willie Nelson, Etta James. Here comes George Michael, but not just George Michael. Was it, was it Wham? It was Wham at that time, even though that was pretty much George. Oh my gosh. That's that to me is the perfect song. It's really? become this joke thing. Like, because the sax, I think. There's nothing wrong with the saxophone. Oh. But George Michael, by the way, is an under, he was an underrated musician. Yeah. And he, and he lasted. He was, he was America's Ricky Martin. He went from Menudo to Ricky Martin. He went from Wham to George Michael, sex symbol. He lived in Dallas for a little bit. Um, I would not have chosen Careless Whisper, although I love this song. Um, there's there's, there's probably a, better choices for the long term. No, the, no, no, no. I, I've told people my, the song for me is a, is a song called The Weight by the band. Oh, and yeah. it, I think it's just one of those songs that you can live, you live the song throughout the four and a half minute journey. And it's just such a, a beautiful song. Okay. Not a, a hippie phase singing that song in high school around really? campfires. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude, it's it's I, it's literally I think it's one of the greatest songs of all time. OK, I don't think you're wrong. Bonus question. Which song do you think you which song do you wish you wrote? Oh, I think that don't say I careless mean, whisper. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> he busts out the saxophone. <laughs> Oh. Uh, I do wish I played, I could play that sax, but um, I, honestly, Patsy Cline to me, that song I've already mentioned, I know I hate to be redundant, but crazy is another one of those perfect song, perfectly written songs. It's just, it's clever. It's simple and clever and simple often aren't the same thing. I mean, it's anything but simple chord wise, but like the concepts, the lyrics, Seinfeld. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, it's a razor's edge. You got to walk. Yeah. But again, crazy wasn't written by Patsy Klein. So what, what's the song that you wish you wrote? Was it, was it, was it crazy? Um, yeah. Okay. I guess so. I'm now not trying to stress self, you out. It's Saturday. I, no, I, feel like I just, I just ruined guessing. your weekend, but it, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be like thing. the rest of the week. Why didn't I say such and such? I mean, hanger 18. Mega what is Dad? that? <laughs> I'm kidding. What is I do Hanger love 18? Hanger 18 by Megadeth, but it's one of the greatest metal songs of all time. I, is Megadeth, I was, it, there was Dave Mustaine, Megadeth? Yes, oh, but so he that's was why you Metallica like briefly. He was Metallica, see, so you, you rode the Mustaine wave. I like it. I, I, I appreciate Megadeth deeply. But, yeah, I mean, you could go pick a Beatles song. I mean, it, I, I mean, I would be really boring and say yesterday and be correct. No, no. It, see, exactly. It's there, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just glad you're not. I was reading something the other day about like the world's most annoying songs. And, um, and, and one of the questions I, I kind of want to <laughs> ask you is I know that you don't like collect music stuff, but obviously I do. One of my favorite pieces ever is I love, I buy working lyrics, which means like it's you literally going and writing the song and it, it turns into the song and, one of my most not controversial pieces, but the, everyone's like, what is wrong with you? But it's also the conversation starter. I have the working lyrics to We Built This City on Rock and Roll by yeah. Starship. But what most people don't know is, you know who wrote that song? Quite no. possibly the greatest songwriter of the last 50 years, Bernie Ledden. Not Bernie Ledden, Bernie Taupin. Of, uh, I did not know that. See? So I, I like it. And I have it on like this little sketch pad. But I, I tell you this to where that that's like fun music memorabilia. But for you... Would there be a piece if you ever saw it and if the stars align that you could have and look at every day and it just brings you to a special place? Maybe it was George Michael's saxophone. Maybe it was Willie Nelson's, you know, who know, pen that he wrote crazy with. But what, what piece would bring you life? I think Kurt Cobain's one of his notebooks. When I yeah. was in junior high, the biggest influence upon me as an artist, if I'm honest and unembarrassed to say it, 
it is Kurt Cobain. Really? Yes. What, which, so uh, I do these auctions, and a few weeks ago I was in one, and you know who Jim Ursay is? He owns the Indianapolis Colts. Yes. Well, I, I found out he was a music fan because he bought Kurt Cobain's Smells Like Teen Spirit guitar, the aqua one. You know, oh, how much yeah. you, you know how much you paid yeah. for it? I four, four and a half million dollars. Oh, is that I'm not, not surprised? Insane? That doesn't what? shock me. Yeah, it's a ja- it's like a jag stang, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm saying, yeah, like I know what the hell that is, and I'm gonna put that <laughs> Rube jag stand. I think you said <laughs> Vulcan. Um, Listen, uh, I'm just showing how strange I am saying word Rube. No, no, I I, I love it, and I, I know we're we're hitting that hour mark, but I've got to ask you um, another fun fanboy question. Yes, you have, keep them coming. You get you get a super group. Okay, you're obviously lead singer. Who's in your super group? Oh man, you just got stressed. I did. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's get Neil Pert and, on the drums. Oh, and but yeah, I was gonna say it could be living or dead. And Neil Pert, by the way, it w- was known for Rush, which is a group that I'm not a fan of. But I can. I'm not a fan that. of either. But. That's such a bullshit answer. You like <laughs> you can't do that. I literally like I was in here last You're night right. with Abby and I and we were going through the list of artists. I was like, it doesn't matter how hard I try, I can't be a fan of groups like Rush, the Ramones, and I just like. But Neil Peart was a great drummer. But that's your drummer. That's who you. You're choose? right. I was comping out. I was. Thank comp- you. I'm nervous. All Thank right. you. I, I have a hard time thinking of names. Um. Then don't then end with the drummer. Who's your lead guitar player? Who's your lead guitarist? Let's go Slash. That's a great guitarist. He's a and great you, one. By the way, the look, there's, this is, there's not a wrong answer. I feel no. Like you're, he's not even like my guitar guy, the one I, I'm, I don't idolize Slash, but I think You're trying to sell tickets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's a great guitarist. He's it's, a great guitarist. He's got a great look. And, I and think quite possibly amazing. responsible for one of the, if not the most iconic guitar riffs ever in Sweet Child of Mine. Yeah, that lead is the, I mean, because of my generation, where I'm from, what I, that lead on that song is the most iconic lead in my life. Yeah. With, with the, when it, when it, when it kicks into the, I mean, it's so good. GNR is a big deal to me, but. I'm going to, I'm going to send you something after we get off. There was this, I'm a big, I'm a big uh, Axel fan. And there yeah. was this like chart a few years ago that came out with essentially like the most impressive vocal range of any artist ever. And number one was literally Axl Rose. Um, really? So he's on the podcast tomorrow. I'm going to talk to him about it. Oh, Axl he, is not. literally like the quintessential rock front man to me. Yeah. With the charisma, the look, the attitude, the not taking shit from anybody. Yeah. I respect and admire because I've, I've often said, like walk to my own beat of my drum because of influenced by people like him yeah you know what i mean he's aged like a pile of cheese but either way um, <laughs> we... i don't know much about him these days but uh, yeah okay so okay so your guitarist is slash neil pert got cut we're gonna come back to him who's playing bass um You're Paul so McCartney st- on bass. Okay, and again, no we're, singing we're, or songwriting, we're, please, we're, Paul. We're, we're not. We're selling tickets here, folks. We <laughs> have already. We have sold out every arena. They're building an arena just for this concert. They're going to go and have the Olympics here after because we have I slash so on, cheesy slash on lead. Most people don't even know that Paul McCartney was the bassist for the Beatles. He's underrated as a bass player. I find what I like about Paul's bass playing is it's melodic first. He yeah, Paul McCart- like a he's a bassist before he's a singer and a songwriter right bullshit <laughs> it's probably because they were in liverpool and they're like someone's got to play this big ass thing that no one really it's gets true any- the stewart guy got cut and he's like well, i guess i'll do it nobody wanted to play bass <laughs> okay um i had that similar thing when i was a kid like everybody's like all right i'll be drummer all right i'll be the sing. i'll not be the bass yep see but I think, the, honestly, when you think about the coolest rock stars, I think they might be bass players. Like Sting, who I'm not a huge fan of, but he's a cool dude. He's a bass player. Paul McCartney, Flea, Rick Danko of, of my favorite group, the band, or at least one of my favorite groups, the band. Um, 
Can so, we have all of the members of Spinal Tap at, on base at once? That Listen, this is your group. And now <laughs> what we just did is we sold tickets and now we have a movie franchise. I can see where your head is going. I can see. Who's I told playing? you I could have been a marketing guy. Who are your who's singing background? Who are your who are your harmony uh your harmony players? It's got to be Michael McDonald, the greatest oh, back, background singer of all time. Of all time. He's unbelievable. By the way, Doobie Brothers are back on tour with their 50th anniversary tour. Michael McDonald is playing with them and Abby and I are going to go see them play and I'm pumped. Uh, That's amazing. I yeah. saw Michael when he was touring with the Dukes of September, which was just essentially him and who else was it um donald fagan wow steely dan boz skaggs boz. and they each wow they boz was the one i didn't really know much I, I gotta admit i didn't know much about boz well i'm gonna give you a I was quick there for lesson Michael. quick lesson you know how boz got his start no he was the guitarist for a guy in a band called the steve miller band Boz Skaggs was Steve Miller's guitarist. How did I not know this tidbit of knowledge? It's okay. Now you do. And that's why we have Rogers Music Tour, is we go and educate all across the board, whether it's a rabe or a, or a, what was it, a rabe? What was the word? The fancy rube. word. You, a rube or Boz Skaggs. See, like we all have our <laughs> gifts. And that's, that's the power of music is, is learning stuff. The careless whisper. You got Michael McDonald singing background, but you need multiple background. Who, who are your other, your harmonizers? I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. Uh, other background singers. Let's see. The Beach Boys? You got Spinal Tap. Might want to have the Beach Boys there. I honestly, now that we're talking about the Beach Boys, I do think the most perfect song is God, God Only, Only Knows. Knows. Well, uh, and again, let's bring it back to the Beatles because you know who else agrees with you is John Lennon. John Lennon called God Only Knows the greatest song of all time because I see a theme here. The Beatles... Guns and Roses, the Beach Boys and Kragic are forming a super group. I like it. I don't see. I told you I never feel like I belong. And that continues in this because I don't, <laughs> I don't belong with those guys. Do you I think... still struggle to, to find myself in this world and in this industry. And hopefully you never find it. And I think, again, like that's why music, you are music. And I think that's what I, I get so envious of it is that I do live that life of not corporate America, but I have to wear slacks. I have to wear pants on a Monday right? You get to go and pick and choose what Monday is for you. And I think that's what is such an astoundingly beautiful thing about you and my, my fandom of you and my friendship with you is that you literally live the life that you choose to live because it's your heart and it's your soul. And, and that's what, you know, makes you you. So, um, man, this has been awesome. I, I could do this literally all day. I've got, yeah, a newborn, me too. I've got a newborn inside that I have to go and, uh, relieve my wife of because, um, you know, she's, she's she's a rock star literally and i'm i'm over yeah. here talking to my pal about music um as we wrap up our first conversation which i would love to do this maybe later today with a, a recorded or not what does music mean to you and, and if you could go and leave the world um a better place because of music what what does that look like honestly to me music is uh, magic it's real magic it's actual magic in its power and it's proof of God to me and proof of love. But also music for me is a means to cope. It's a means to not destruct, self-destruct. If I didn't have music, I, I'd be a goner. I've been able to take all that negative spirit, negative energy and make it into something beautiful. And to me, if just some people enjoy that and I can change the, their lives in a small way, then everything is worth it. And I feel some semblance of purpose and joy. Dude, let me tell you, that was beautiful. And I think that that's, that's going to be a Joshism. I think that what you just in, in, in said was such a powerfully poetic and you thing, even though, and here's a fun fact, y'all we've never met in person. This is a friendship that, we, we, we probably never, we don't want to meet in person because it'll just, it will just implode. And then we'll just, we'll, <laughs> it's too we'll, much power. We'll sit here until we don't sleep, we don't hydrate, and all of a sudden we just literally just combust. But um, that's what's so you know, powerful about you, man, is that you have a way of going and making things so overly complicated from a way like that I don't understand, but I do understand it. And then right when I think that I, I lose you, you're going to go and throw out Slash 
or Kurt Cobain <laughs> or Chris Cornell. And, 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 and again, that's the power of music. And I, and that's why this thing has become such an obsession for me is that I want people to feel what you feel, what I feel, but it's gotta be in their own way. Even if it's somebody who's a terrible musician like Rush, we want you to go and own it and find other people that, that agree with you. What were you going to say? I cut you off. Well, I was going to say, like, I do love you, Rogers, and we have developed a friendship. But like, for me, it's social media, the internet, whatever all this is, it's, it's anti my natural. But when I was a kid, artists were mysterious. They didn't share themselves like, like, like a lot of artists do now. And so I'm always struggling to find that balance of hiding and saving and like getting out there and being, and I never thought the internet could be a place where you could make loving relationships. There was a time in my life I was cynical of that, yeah. but my relationship with you and some others has changed my mind on that. And I know that there's true love to be out there digitally for all of us to be found with each other. On behalf of everyone on Instagram, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome guys. Uh, man, this, this has been so awesome, Josh. And uh, I, I want to make sure people can go and support you other than just being a fan. So what's the best place for them to go and find you other than Instagram and social media? Yeah, you, I've got a Spotify page with where you can find all my music, iTunes and all that. If you come to my, um, I, I respond to messages on the social media. So come say hello. That's Did that's you just true. say on, on, on the social media? Did I sound that old? I respond to messages on the internet. Um, <laughs> on the internets on the internets so um what's what what about uh any upcoming projects let's get people excited a little bit here and by the way y'all one of the most powerfully cool moments ever josh actually sang the first song for my wife and me which we're going to give some uh, teasers on that later because he's given me permission to go and share the videos which we'll get to but for future projects how do we go in and, and stay connected and when is that coming out I've got a Patreon page. You can go there and get, get some behind the scenes stuff and we're going to get that together. But I've been working on a record for three years and it's been a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> at least you're being honest. And I, I started writing it uh, when the pandemic happened. I did. I became obsessed with the quarantine concerts. I did. I did a concert every day for like 165, 125 days. Oh, I, I took a couple Sundays off, but other than that, it was straight and I became obsessed with that. And, but in that, I wrote a lot of great I, starts of songs. And so it's been three years into that. I'm working on that. That record will be coming. It might be two. And so you can find, I have a Patreon page. YouTube, we're going to start doing more with. So I'm, I'm just still, until I get this record done, I've been sort of really un, not very visible. And once that happens, I will be so relieved. Well. We can't wait. And, and y'all make sure to go follow him on Instagram and on, on the Facebook and on the internet and on the World Wide <laughs> Web. Um, and, yes, and the Spotify. Listen and, and, Spotify and the Spotify please. and then get your get your account on the iTunes. And I, I believe in downloading music, by the way. And I, and I love the tangible feel of records. But um, I made a commitment that I do uh, one record every single day. So y'all that are watching this today, I want you to go and subscribe to the same theory and download Josh Kragic's music in watch what happens and the rain throughout his first album and all of his other albums. Uh, it's, it's powerful. And that's what this guy embodies. And y'all that are not watching this on YouTube or on social media, look him up because he's exactly what you think. And I think that's such a cool thing about Josh is he just embodies. He's a, he's a character. Josh to me is a superpower <laughs> for music and um, he's only getting stronger. So Josh, I love you. We love you. My family oh, loves too. you. And uh, we thank you for giving us the most, um powerful hour i've had um in a while so thank you very much thank you rogers you're welcome